Hello, and welcome to this Climate 201 episode of Physical Attraction. In this series of episodes, we're going to be discussing one of the more controversial topics that has reared its head in the climate change discourse over the last few years. Yes, it's time for a deep dive on negative emissions. Let's start with the definition here. Negative emissions, which are sometimes called negative emissions technologies, or NETs, is essentially the term given to a whole class of different activities and technologies that would take CO2 out of the atmosphere and permanently store or sequester that CO2 somewhere that is not the atmosphere. Now, there is an important distinction here between negative emissions technologies and carbon capture and storage, or CCS. Occasionally, you do see people using the terms interchangeably. Sadly, quite often politicians haven't got the distinction. But when most people refer to CCS or carbon capture, they generally mean capturing the emissions from some process before they enter the atmosphere. So this could be at a fossil fuel power plant or at some other industrial process like steel that involves the burning of fossil fuels. This is distinct from sucking the emissions out of the atmosphere and actually reducing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Although, of course, some of the technologies involved, such as the transportation and burying of CO2 when it's produced, are shared between different types of these technologies. So you'll see some CCS that is used as part of negative emissions technologies, but the two are technically distinct. Sometimes people will also refer to this when it's done at large scale as carbon dioxide removal, CDR, or greenhouse gas removal, GGR, which includes the other greenhouse gases aside from CO2. As usual, these terms can often also be used interchangeably when people are being a bit loose about these things. My personal opinion is that CO2 is the main greenhouse gas we would need to worry about removing for all sorts of reasons, not least that things like methane, the second biggest contributor to warming, decays into CO2 on a time scale of a few years. But this is by the by. And occasionally, you will hear people refer to large-scale removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere as geoengineering, because it is intentional manipulation of the Earth's climate by removing CO2 from the atmosphere and changing the atmospheric composition in the sort of opposite way to the way that we've been doing it with our big industrial experiment. I don't really like using the term geoengineering to refer to this, because I think that for most people, geoengineering means solar radiation management, or in other words, blocking out the sun to try and counteract the effects of climate change. And I think that it's arguably using technologies to directly clean up our mess by removing CO2 from the atmosphere, rather than aiming to re-engineer and intentionally intervene in the Earth's climate to try and offset the effects of climate change. But you do sometimes see people referring to this at the large scale when it's big enough to influence the climate as geoengineering. However, I think that as negative emissions have become more and more mainstream and unfortunately more and more assumed by climate change scenarios and policymakers, using the term geoengineering to describe them has increasingly fallen out of favour. But we will discuss why it is in some ways more applicable to different types of technology than others. So with all of these different definitions out of the way, let's get into why we're talking about this. Because later I'm going to talk about the different natures of the technologies that are considered to do this, some of their pros and cons, the technical challenges with realising them, their state of readiness and so on, because there are a range of different ideas that have been proposed and are being worked on. But I want to start the series by talking about why we need to discuss this at all. So we're going to go really in depth into the idea of negative emissions in general, before we get to the specifics of how they might actually be delivered. And that will involve asking basic questions like, where are we with climate change now and how did we get here? When he wrote his excellent work on climate change, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, the late, great David Mackay entitled his chapter on negative emissions, The Last Thing We Should Talk About. Here's what he wrote in the introduction. He said, quote, When I say this, I am deliberately expressing a double meaning. First, the energy requirements for carbon capture from thin air are so enormous it seems almost absurd to talk about it. And there's the worry that raising the possibility of fixing climate change by this sort of geoengineering might promote inaction today. But second, I do think we should talk about it, contemplate how best to do it, and fund research into how to do it better. Because capturing carbon from thin air may turn out to be our last line of defence, if climate change is as bad as the climate scientists expect, and if humanity fails to take the cheaper and more sensible options that may still be available today. Mackay wrote that in 2008. If we had started reducing global CO2 emissions in that year, assuming that we can't get to net negative emissions, The maximum rate at which we would need to reduce global emissions would be 5% a year to have a good shot at the 1.5c target in the Paris Agreement. For those who listened to our episode on carbon budgets, you'll know that this is all with IPCC estimates and there's an error bar either way here. But basically, if we'd started when Mackay wrote that in 2008, the maximum rate we'd have to reduce our emissions would have been 5% a year without relying on any negative emissions. 
However, instead, emissions in the decade after 2008 continued their relentless rise, chewing up the remainder of our carbon budget. So to reach that 1.5 degrees Celsius target now, we would need to reduce emissions by 15% a year. Now, obviously, the intention of the COVID-19 lockdowns around the world were not to reduce emissions. Perhaps we'll never know what a truly motivated world could do if we treated climate change as the same level of emergency as we did the pandemic. But those global lockdowns, that massive change in behaviour and the global recession and so on, may have reduced emissions by around 7-8% to in the year 2020. So less than half of what we would need to do to get this 15% a year reduction that would be required now to reach 1.5 degrees target without negative emissions. So that gives you an idea of how Herculean the effort would now have to be, and frankly how unlikely mainstream policymakers would consider that to be, especially before the COVID-19 pandemic. Imagine someone proposing this as a course of action in 2018-2019, it's difficult to comprehend that. And this of course is a consequence of delay, delay, delay. If we had been able to start reducing emissions in 2000 for a 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature target, we would have been able to decarbonise at a leisurely pace of 1-2% to of emissions a year. Now it's looking virtually impossible to do so, requiring breakneck pace of action to reach that 1.5 degrees Celsius target. Techno-optimists would argue that we spent the last 20 years developing the technologies that would make it possible to decarbonise this rapidly now. And it is certainly true that we have seen in different technological adoptions and so on that you can get quite rapid adoption as soon as something becomes obviously more uh, advantageous. You see a sort of S-shaped curve where things rapidly switch over and the transition is fairly quick. And within a few years, you know, everyone is no longer using the old systems. If you consider something like how fast mobile phones spread around the world, that's been true in that case of technology. Obviously, for an energy infrastructure, which has a lot more inertia built into it, we expect that transition to be slower. But you do wonder if we had taken this a bit more seriously, you know, if in the 1970s and 1980s, when these things were first being discovered, and when it became clear that we would have to shift away from systems that emitted CO2, if we had actually taken it as seriously then as the situation merited it, we could have had those technologies decades ago, and perhaps we would have been well on our way to reducing emissions already. Because this is the interesting thing, I mean, people talk about this as a way of buying time for technology to develop, but mitigating earlier would have bought us time for technological development too, only it never seemed to go that way. There's another way of looking at the challenge for 1.5 degrees Celsius, which I think is quite interesting, and a recent paper was published in 2018 which made this point. And the point that they essentially tried to make was that 1.5 degrees Celsius was still physically possible i.e. it still depended on human decisions as to what to do, whether we would get to this 1.5 degrees target. But to do this, we would have to phase out all fossil fuel emitting infrastructure at the end of its lifetime. So bear in mind this paper was published in 2018. Amongst the implications of what we'd have to do immediately, for that to make sense, would be the following. No fossil fuel emitting cars could be sold after 2018. Every new car that was purchased would have to be fully electric and powered by renewables or nuclear power. You could have no new gas-fired boilers for heating. Every new heating system constructed would have to be carbon neutral. You could have no new fossil fuel power plants to be constructed. All existing ones would have to be retired at the end of their life and replaced with renewables, nuclear or storage. All fossil fuel power plants under construction would have had to have been cancelled and all the ones planned would also have to be immediately cancelled. All planes and ships to be zero carbon or carbon neutral by 2040. And they also say that cows and other methane-emitting herd animals would have to be phased out over the course of their lifetime, so over the following three years after that had taken place. And if you do all that, then you'll stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius without negative emissions. So when you hear that list of policies or demands or requirements, you get the picture. I mean, that was 2018. Those things obviously haven't happened. There are different degrees of impossible that we can think about here. There will be different studies with different budgets and different models that come to different conclusions about what needs to happen. What I would say is when you look at something like this, it seems like getting to 1.5 degrees without negative emissions may be technically possible, but I think you would be foolish to bet on it actually happening. For a long time now, climate and economic modelers have tried to come up with mitigation scenarios. Typically, these are ways of determining how we will be able to get to a certain temperature target. And typically it will involve something called an integrated assessment model. That is essentially an economic model that also tries to model how technologies will be developed and spread throughout the world. 
you throw in a lot of assumptions about how much it will cost to deploy different types of technology, how long it will take to do that, how feasible it is to scale different technologies up, whether there are other constraints on how much can be deployed, etc., and so on. And you throw in some assumptions about economic and population growth and so on. As these things are deployed, they then work out, the model works out how much CO2 is being emitted in these scenarios and the impact that this will have on global mean temperature, typically. So then you will ask the model to find different pathways and say, okay, show me, generate for me scenarios where we reach our temperature goal, where we're below 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, or where we keep to below 2 degrees Celsius, as in the Paris Agreement targets. Usually you will then also tell the model to minimise the financial cost of doing this. Or alternatively, sometimes the models do this in a similar way. They have an economic model and they implement a global carbon price that increases over time. So now that there's a cost to emitting a ton of CO2, companies and individuals, which are assumed to be these rational profit-maximising beasties that we see in economics, when they have to pay a tax for emitting CO2, they stop doing things that emit CO2 and replace activities that are carbon emitting with less CO2 intensive activities over time. And depending on the range of assumptions that you put in and the range of different figures that you come up with and the different scenarios that are generated, you get a huge range of scenarios that are compatible with 2 degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees Celsius. And these are ways that things like the world's energy mix, the transportation, the agriculture, the industry, the economic activity of humanity, essentially, has to evolve in the next few decades or over the 21st century to keep to within the climate change targets. So that, in a nutshell, is what I mean when I talk about integrated assessment modelling. And whether we like it or not, these models have been very influential in climate policy and politics so far. Because, at the very least, they give us the idea that we have found the most cost-effective ways to tackle climate change, and some global targets for deploying the various technologies and so on that we need to in order to achieve that goal. We'll talk more about why this is happening later on, but it's undeniable that, alongside very rapid deployment of renewables and retiring of fossil fuel emitting infrastructure, when you ask these models what they think we should do to get this cost-effective solution to climate change, many of them really like negative emissions. They deploy huge amounts of negative emissions. In other words, increasingly, as we continue to go on without these major emission cuts, COVID notwithstanding, Plan B is becoming Plan A, in spite of what David Mackay hoped. Technically speaking, because we have the result that we talked about in the carbon budgets episode, that temperature increase is approximately proportional to cumulative CO2 emissions, the idea here is that you can suck billions of tonnes of CO2 out of the atmosphere in the second half of the century to make up for the fact that you're emitting them now. And while you might overshoot your temperature goal a little in the middle of the century, by 2100 you'll be back down there after a few decades of global cooling due to your net negative emissions. So I just want to emphasise this, because I know that often when I talk about climate change I can get bogged down in this technocratic and technical language because that's how a lot of researchers talk to each other. The point that you should take away from this is that mainstream climate politics and policy and modelling at the moment basically says, yes, we can still achieve the Paris Agreement targets that the world signed up to in 2015. But it also more and more tells us that the most cost-effective and best way to do this is to suck billions of tonnes of CO2 out of the atmosphere every year towards the end of the century and bury it somewhere. All of this, of course, on top of kicking the fossil fuel addiction that has driven much of our civilization's growth over the last two and a half centuries, and rapidly reducing emissions, which have pretty much only ever grown exponentially throughout our history, to zero in a matter of decades. And frankly, I think this is something that just isn't that well known outside of climate change circles, how we've got to the situation where a pretty huge fraction of our supposed and claimed ability to hit the Paris Agreement goals, at least in the way that the technocrats who are in charge of the process say will do it, depends on technologies which are often dubious and which have never been deployed at anything like the scale that is suggested in the models. This increasing dependence on negative emissions has been explored a lot by researchers, however, particularly in recent years after Paris. One notable paper was Kevin Anderson and Glenn Peters back in 2016, who wrote a paper called The Trouble with Negative Emissions. The aim here was to show just how much the mainstream climate change scenarios actually depended on negative emissions. So for this paper, they looked at 76 scenarios that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, were modelling. And these are all scenarios that come out of IAMS, and they were all two degrees Celsius scenarios. 
almost all of these mainstream climate scenarios, I think all but maybe three or four of them, alongside cutting emissions quickly, used massive amounts of negative emissions. On average, the median scenario said that by 2100, we would be sucking around 15 billion tonnes of CO2 out of the atmosphere every year. Of that, in those scenarios, you, you have to understand that the negative emissions are actually fulfilling two purposes in those scenarios. One is undoing damage that's already been done, so net taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, and the other is undoing damage that we would be continuing to do. In other words, cancelling out continued emissions of CO2 from various different sources, such as industrial processes and transportation processes, which the models say are too expensive or difficult to stop emitting. So actually, if you look at these scenarios, on average they're sucking out 15 billion tonnes of CO2 from the atmosphere through negative emissions. 8 billion tonnes of that is cancelling out these residual emissions in industry and transport, and another 7 billion are net negative emissions, essentially compensating for the emissions from previous decades and generations. And you can see how this works from a sort of economic modeler's point of view, from a kind of technocratic point of view, when you consider the prices of avoiding emitting a tonne of CO2 or cancelling it out afterwards. So if in your model it says, well, if you're going to replace flying with travelling on sailboats or something, that is going to come at a cost to you for reducing emissions of $400 per tonne of CO2, but we have negative emissions technologies available that will only cost you $50 per tonne of CO2, then the model is inevitably going to say the most cost-effective way is to cancel out that tonne with negative emissions and continue flying instead. So that's partly why you get that 8 billion tonnes that is cancelling out the continued emissions of CO2 from various sources. The 7 billion tonnes, that is net negative emissions, are compensating for the emissions that they consider we won't be able to cancel out quickly enough to stay within the temperature target. So let's try and explore the scale of this a bit. Currently, our emissions are around 40 billion tonnes of CO2 every year, globally. So in many of these scenarios, by the end of the century, we're sucking out nearly half as much CO2 of the atmosphere as we're actually emitting today in all of our industrial processes. Here's another comparison. In 2019, the world produced 95.2 million barrels of oil per day. That translates to around 4.8 billion tonnes of oil extracted from the ground every year. So, to achieve our climate goals... These scenarios assume that we will be able to bury and store around three times the mass of CO2 as we do oil, as we extract oil today. One obvious difference is that, you know, people will pay you for taking oil out of the ground. But as yet, there's no mechanism to explain who will pay for cleaning up our historical mess and burying our historical CO2. The other point of comparison to make, of course, is with where the negative emissions industry actually is today. By 2100, these scenarios say we need to suck out 15 billion tonnes a year. Heck, on some of these paths, by 2030, in just nine years now, we need to be removing a billion tonnes a year of CO2. Where are we today? Well, it's hard to say for sure, because some people would count afforestation as negative emissions. However, we're still deforesting the world on average, so I'm not really convinced that we can say we're getting any negative emissions from any tree planting activities that we have going on, regardless of how much people like to talk about those tree planting activities. Two of the most promising and most widely discussed technologies for negative emissions at scale are bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BEX, and direct air capture, or DAC. Now we'll discuss these technologies in much more detail in future episodes, but basically, the first involves burning biofuels to make electricity, capturing the CO2 produced at the exhaust pipe, and burying it. The whole procedure is hopefully net negative in terms of CO2, because the plants take up CO2 to grow, and then you essentially bury that CO2 when you burn them, so they've on average taken it out of the atmosphere. Direct air capture involves artificial chemical reactions that scrub CO2 out of the atmosphere, where it can then be buried. These are the two main ones used in scenarios, and in these scenarios most of those billions of tonnes come from BEX. So you might be asking, how much BEX has been deployed so far? Well, in terms of BEX, there are six active pilot projects. The largest one is the Decatur project in Illinois, which captures CO2 from ethanol production. It's not a net negative project, because it actually only captures around 16% of the CO2 that is made when ethanol is produced. <laughs> 
so the whole operations of the plant are still emitting CO2. It has a target to capture around 1 million tonnes of CO2 a year. It was first funded in 2010 with a government injection of around $200 million and has captured 1 million tonnes in the decades since. So you look at the Decatur plant, this is the biggest plant, it's not a net negative operation and it's been capable of capturing about a million tonnes in the decade since. Assuming that it could capture that goal of a million tonnes a year, we would only need a thousand more of those built in the next decade around the world to reach our goal. Naturally, nothing I do would be complete without the UK reference, so I have to tell you that the power company Drax in 2019 trumpeted on their website that they had the first BEX pilot project in Europe. The press release excitedly told us that this moves Britain further ahead in the race to develop BEX technologies, essential in the fight against climate change. And they also claimed that it could enable Drax to become the first ever negative emissions power station. So this is quite a big deal, right? The first BEX plant in Europe? Well... It currently sequesters one tonne of carbon dioxide a day, 365 tonnes a year. Drax, as of 2020, are talking about sequestering 16 million tonnes of CO2 a year by 2050, which would deliver a third of the negative emissions that the UK government and its climate change committee says it will need by 2050 to hit its net zero target. So obviously there's a lot of scaling up to do before we get anywhere close to that. And... Suffice it to say, these projects as they exist at the moment are at best a proof of concept and at worst not really a proof of anything. Dunking on Bex has become a bit of a hobby for climate folks in recent years, and we'll be doing a lot more of that later on, but I should also dunk a little on direct air capture as well before we finished here. There are again a very small number of direct air capture plants out there. And they get so many articles written about them in science and tech journalism that you wouldn't believe. Take Climeworks, for example, a headline from last year. Can Climeworks save the world from climate change? Science three years ago. In Switzerland, a giant new machine is directly sucking carbon from the air. And Climeworks' own website describes it as a technology to reverse climate change. Now, I think there are big problems with emphasising this stuff because people might see it on the news or they might see a headline about it and they think, ah yes, of course, we can easily suck the CO2 back out of the atmosphere. Technology is going to fix this problem, you know, good for us. But they don't appreciate the scale of what's actually happening here. So Climeworks pilot plant in 2017-18, it captured around 900 tonnes of CO2 a year. Now, bear in mind, of course, that we're talking about capturing billions of tonnes by mid-century for any of this to actually work out. And also that that even in terms of people, that is not that impressive. You know, the the average carbon footprint for someone uh, per capita in the US, I think is about 15 tonnes of CO2 a year. So when you look at it from that perspective, you can see that this is compensating for maybe 60, 70 people, a pilot plant. I don't know how many people work at the pilot plant, Um, But you can imagine that there's a considerable fraction of the uh, emissions attributable to those people uh, is is working at the plant is is being captured by the plant itself, if you see what I mean. Their rivals have included Carbon Engineering, who had a plant that captured around 300 tonnes a year. So actually, if you go away and work this out, Climeworks has about 100 employees. It's in Switzerland, where the per capita emissions are lower than they are in the US and in other countries. So their 100 employees if you assume that they all account for an equal share of per capita emissions, probably account for about 437 tonnes of CO2 a year, and they're capturing around 900 tonnes a year. So they're more or less cancelling out what they do, and maybe a few hundred other Swiss people uh, at most, and that's it at the moment. This is another way of framing it, just to get you an idea of the scale of what's going on here. Now, Climeworks are constructing a new plant that will capture 4,000 tonnes a year, so these things are scaling up but you can question how quickly they're scaling up and how likely they are to scale up. I mean, Climeworks itself says that it has an ambition to capture 1% of global CO2 emissions by 2025. That might not sound like that much, just knocking off 1% with this technology that we're talking about. If I was telling you that we were going to spend episodes and episodes talking about a technology that will hopefully knock off 1% of global emissions, you might be a bit confused about that and why we're prioritising it so much. But if if that is the case, that will need 250,000, they say, of the plants that they currently have that have already been existed to be constructed in the next five years. And there is a very real question about whether anything like that is going to happen at all. I mean, 
you get to the point where you can say, you know, anyone can quote these numbers, anyone can make these numbers and say, yeah, if I build 250,000 of these machines, it will make a, a significant difference. But as to whether that will actually happen, we don't yet know. I think it's unlikely. You know, their rivals uh, in the direct air capture space include Carbon Engineering, who have a plant that captures around 300 tonnes a year. Carbon Engineering is now working on a plant that they hope will capture up to a million tonnes a year as of 2019. Construction is due to start in 2021, and they hope it'll be up and running by 2024. But again, you see the problem here. By 2030, we want a billion. By 2024, at best, we'll have one plant that can do a million from this company, and a few other scattered projects around the place. Glenn Peters is one of the authors of that paper, and he's a great follow on Twitter, at Peters Glenn, for anyone who wants to follow him. That's Peters underscore Glenn with one N. He understands the world of IAMs better than anyone, and he pointed out something. If you built 1 million tonne per year CCS facilities every day from now until 2050, you would end up with 11 gigatons of CO2 per year being captured by then, which is the average amount of CCS projected in these scenarios for 2 degrees Celsius. So, the biggest plant that is currently planned in terms of negative emissions, which is one of the only ones, or a handful at most, will produce negative emissions of a million tonnes a year. And to get up with the median amount of CCS that these models are projecting for the future, you would need to build one such plant every day from now until 2050. So this is giving you an idea that we really are orders of magnitude away in terms of this stuff from where we need to be. In, at least if these scenarios are going to be the way that we address climate change, which you may be beginning to doubt. And I don't say any of this to be harsh to these technologies or to the people developing them. I have a lot of respect for all of the scientists and researchers involved, and sadly I believe that negative emissions technologies at some considerable scale are now likely to be necessary if we want to get to below our Paris Agreement targets, unfortunately, because of delays in the past and continued delays in the future. I hope for their success, and I've supported some of them financially by being a customer for the negative emissions to help them get off the ground. And of course, it's true that all technologies start off being very, very small scale and very expensive, and can get a lot cheaper and capable of a lot more when they scale up. I wouldn't deny those things. It's those processes that have allowed us to have the Industrial Revolution, and that hopefully will allow us to have a green Industrial Revolution, which will put the first one on more sustainable footing. All of these things are true of other technologies, and we better hope they are true of this one too. But I make this point simply to show you and to illustrate that the gap between where we are now and where the IPCC and the mainstream climate scenarios think we need to be for negative emissions is a vast gap. They are really by far the furthest gap between the scenarios and reality at the moment. We're much, much closer, and therefore, frankly, much more likely to succeed when it comes to renewables and even things that are further off, like electrifying heating and transport and so on, the other things that reduce emissions. Whereas for negative emissions technologies, these things are only just starting to be demonstrated in one-off pilot projects, and they're not necessarily ready to scale without a huge influx of cash and effort to deploy them. And as we've touched on, it's not clear where that cash is going to come from. Government grants have proved to be enough for the odd one-off project, but with the current set of people in charge, will they really stretch to a thousand of them? I, I don't think so, I can't see it. It is worth pointing out, of course, that there's a conflict here. Some people saying, okay, well, because these technologies are supposedly needed in these models, and we're so far behind, we should be focusing on them and investing in them and finding ways to bring them to the glorious power of the free market to uh, invest in and, and, and make worthwhile. Other people will say, all of this is a distraction. These technologies are obviously never going to take off. We have to focus on what we can focus on, uh, which is you know, maybe doing some research and development for these technologies and hoping that they're going to get cheaper at an earlier stage, but spending most of our effort and concentrating most of our effort on deploying the technologies that we have now, that we know are cost effective and that we know exist in terms of renewables, energy efficiency, electrifying heat, transportation, industry... I think I'm very much on the second group of those people who think we need to deploy what we can deploy right now and as fast as possible, and that should be our principal focus rather than researching technologies into the future. I'm going to justify that description a little bit later on. But it's worth pointing out that, of course, these are just climate scenarios where these things happen, being generated by these economic models, these integrated assessment models. And many people, 
I think increasingly many, are starting to heavily criticise the process for generating these climate change scenarios and thinking about what's really feasible at all, particularly this focus on cost and for other reasons that we'll get into later. So I should stress here that you don't necessarily need to build a million tonnes of CCS per day until 2050 to keep to below these targets. There are ways of getting there that don't require that. But if you want to avoid having to do that, then you need to smash the mitigation button, cutting emissions by switching away from fossil fuels for electricity, transport, heating, and emissions from agriculture, even faster and even harder than you do in these scenarios. You need to go even harder on electrification and so on if you want to avoid these negative emissions. There are certain types of industrial activity you probably need to scale back to avoid them. You need to redouble your urgency. And while these technologies are definitely more advanced than the negative emissions, we still have a lot of deployment that we need to do to shift fossil fuels out of our energy system. Now, I can almost hear some of the tech optimists amongst you, and maybe the internal tech optimist in me, saying, but we're talking about some of this stuff at the end of the century. You don't know what kind of technologies we'll have available by then. Imagine someone from 1940 trying to predict the technologies of today. All technologies start off by being massively expensive and inefficient, and then they get better and take over the world. And okay, to an extent, that's a valid argument. And it's this kind of techno-optimism that's really embedded in these models and underlies why a lot of them really like negative emissions. The assumption is that in the future we'll effectively be much richer, we'll have more advanced technology. You combine that with the economic assumption of discount rates, where you care less about future costs than present costs. And you can see why it's tempting to shove a lot of the heavy lifting towards the end of the century, when sucking masses of CO2 out of the atmosphere will be, supposedly, cheap compared to our economy's size by then. But there are some obvious counterpoints to this. The first is that, of course, this assumes that these technologies will actually be developed in the meantime. But at the moment, there is not really any financial incentive to develop them. There isn't really any mechanism for anyone to make money by cleaning up our historical mess. And, as we've discussed before, seeking profit increasingly drives our innovation and, well, virtually all of our activities in an increasingly privatised world. Now, in future episodes, I will talk about the kinds of incentives that we might build, but, as yet, not much exists. So there's a difference here between this and other technologies. Solar panels and wind farms and computers and planes started off expensive and inefficient and hard to make, and now they have indeed taken over the world to an increasing extent, yes. But people wanted to buy solar panels and wind farms and computers and planes. There was, eventually, after initial government subsidies, a massive market that helped these things develop, and a clear profit motive if you could get them going. You could sell the energy that you produced. You can use computers and planes for all kinds of things. And these technologies, too, still had to have decades to develop and scale up. That's time that we may not now have to deploy these new negative emissions technologies to the extent that we need to, according to these models. Secondly, of course, this techno-optimistic scenario assumes that economic growth and technological development will continue unabated without running into any limits to growth, say because of the impact that we've had on the environment so far. Third, sure, the second half of the century, 2100, might seem a long way off, but to get there, you need negative emissions to start scaling up much earlier than that. The median trajectory here has around 4 billion tonnes of CO2 being removed by negative emissions every year by 2040. That's not long at all. That's, you know, the years since George Bush came into power. In these scenarios, we basically have 20 years to create an industry that can start burying as much CO2 underground as we currently extract in oil in around the same amount of time since the first Shrek movie was in cinemas. That's a lot to do, you know? And the final point I would make is a simple one. You can't beat physics with clever technology. It doesn't matter how smart you are. We're going to talk about many of the different ways to try and get to negative emissions, but the basic fact is simple. If you are going to try and engage in some activity, or create some industry, that scrubs this much CO2 out of the atmosphere, there are no real shortcuts to doing that. So when I give talks about this, I try to coin this as Hornigold's Law. You can't cheat physics with fancy technology. Your industry to clean up your mess has to be on a similar scale to the industry that is currently making the mess. Your industry for taking CO2 out of the atmosphere to compensate for what we're doing now must be on a similar scale to the industry that is currently putting it in. You can't just build a few machines, three or four, and hope that they will cancel out what we're doing elsewhere, because the process will not be that efficient.
It's just a shame for us that this is pretty much all of industry. There are fundamental physical limits in terms of the energy that you will need to supply to pull these trillions upon trillions of molecules out of the atmosphere. Maybe you'll get it through solar panels. They'll need to cover a wide area. They'll cost money too. Maybe you'll get it through nuclear. You'll need a lot of power plants. Maybe you'll try and enhance some natural carbon sinks by planting trees or biofuel crops and burying the carbon that they sequester. You're going to need to plant, move around, burn billions of tonnes of plants. To make them, you'll need a lot of land area and water devoted to this effort for that. You're going to need infrastructure that will allow you to physically move around and permanently store billions of tonnes of liquefied CO2 somewhere. Sure, innovations will make the process more efficient. Sure, energy costs, especially from renewables, will continue to get cheaper. But moving stuff around, physically moving it around, still requires expenditure. There's no technology that allows you to get around those laws of physics. There's no getting around the fact that this would need to be an industry on a huge physical scale, simply because you are actually trying to accomplish a gargantuan physical task, which will require infrastructure that will take many years to build, which means we'd have to start very soon to accomplish this. Technologies can help, but only so much. Just ask the oil industry. So if this is an oil industry in reverse, just think about the huge levels of the projects that are doing there, how much government subsidy they need, and they can actually sell what they're producing, whereas we would not be able to if we were burying stuff underground. People who discuss this seriously, I think, are well aware of this fact. One proposal, for example, involves a guy called Klaus Lackner, who has made these artificial trees. These trees are made of a certain kind of plastic that can absorb CO2 from the air. You treat the plastic with heat and water, and the CO2 can be extracted from that plastic, turned into a liquid, transported, and piped underground and buried. Lackner points out that you could cancel out today's annual CO2 emissions if you had a fleet of around 85 million of his artificial trees, producing around 10 million new artificial trees each year to maintain it. That's not so different to the car industry, which produces around 85 million vehicles a year and is around 3% of the world economy. The difference is that people actually buy cars because they like them, and can use them to get places, and they don't have to treat them with heat and water regularly and scrape off their CO2 and bury it so that they can live in a vaguely safe climate. So to accomplish this, we're talking about a new negative emissions industry, dedicated to clearing up our waste that's not really making a profit by doing it, that would be similar in size to one of the biggest industries in the world today. I know I'm really belabouring the point here, but this I think is the problem sometimes with our faith in technology to solve all of our problems. You'll see articles occasionally about one of these pilot negative emissions projects, and the comments are often, this is brilliant stuff, scientists have invented a way out of the problem, we can reverse what's going on. Or this is presented as some kind of solution to climate change that might even mean we don't need to worry about reducing our emissions anymore. And while the pilot plan to whatever might be very impressive technically and scientifically, the point is not so much that the technology exists in principle, but that we need to scale it up to this truly massive scale and have a means of paying for it. Just having the technology is not the main breakthrough here that suddenly solves the problem. I'm reminded of one of the fundamental sciences that was attempted to be developed over many, many centuries throughout history. You'll remember this is one that Isaac Newton was interested in, which is the science of alchemy, right? Alchemy, the idea that you could find a way through chemical reactions, through, although they didn't call them that then, to transmute base metals and turn them into gold. You know, the interesting thing is that scientists have actually found a way to gradually change the elements, uh, atoms of individual elements, into different elements, right? We, We have discovered enough about nuclear physics, and we now know enough about these processes, that alchemy, in a sense, is possible. You can produce small amounts of gold uh, by blasting uh, neutrons and, and protons off of heavier elements of metal. You know, I think that they've produced a few atoms of gold in this way by blasting lasers at platinum, if I remember rightly. The point here is that alchemy is now possible, in principle. But that doesn't mean that it's the cheapest way to get gold. The cheapest way to get gold is still digging it out of the ground like it always has been. Just because something is possible, if you have these incredible limits on how much of it you're able to do and the throughput that you can get and the cost that it will uh, 
achieve and the infrastructure that's required to do it, it doesn't actually mean that it will happen. And I think that's something we need to bear in mind when we think about some of these technologies. Innovation and invention is very important, but not enough on its own. Renewables are already the cheapest form of electricity across most of the world. Electric vehicles can already be made, but it's about actually deploying them. And in that sense, negative emissions are unlikely to be the silver bullet, because it's hardly clear that building some massive new negative emissions industry will be easier than replacing our old polluting industries with more carbon neutral ones. And this goes for the future again. You know, maybe it can happen. We have built remarkable industries before. Things will get cheaper if they are deployed, once you actually deploy those things. But you still have to consider Hornigold's law. The industry to remove CO2 from the atmosphere has to be on a similar scale to the industry that's putting it in. That doesn't mean that we can't do it or that we couldn't do some of this. We probably will have to do some of this. But it just means you have to be realistic about what you're talking about here. No technological breakthrough will change the requirement to move around billions of tonnes of liquid CO2. That's going to be hard. I hope this episode, the first in our series on negative emissions, has served as a little explainer as to how we got here and where we actually are in terms of these scenarios depending so much on negative emissions and these visions of the future that increasingly depend on negative emissions. In the next episode, we'll continue some of this general discussion surrounding these technologies, including some of the serious and thorny political questions that would be posed by this approach to solving climate change. And then we'll talk about details of the specific technologies later. Thank you for listening to this episode of Climate 201 from Physical Attraction. Remember, if you have any comments, questions or concerns, you can get in touch with us on our website at physicalpodcast.com. There you will find the contact form, and I really love hearing from all of you when you have any comments, questions or concerns about the show in the course of this climate change series. If there's anything you want to know about climate change or climate mitigation or climate policies, please do ask, and I will endeavour to answer those questions. I want this to be a good learning resource. And of course, part of that is that if you think it's been helpful, if you think you've learned something from it, please do share it with others who may also be interested. You can help out the show in a number of different ways. One, of course, is by telling other people to listen to it. We rely on that word of mouth to get the word out and compete with the Kardashians or the Sussexes or whoever has their big podcast out today. We rely on word of mouth, so please do tell other people to listen to it and review the show. All of these things help us to get noticed. You can, of course, support us financially as well. We have a PayPal link. We have a Patreon, patreon.com slash physical attraction. For a very small fee, if you subscribe there, you will get access to special bonus episodes that only people who subscribe get hold of. And you will also get access to early release episodes uh, many weeks before they come out on the main feed. So if you need your fix, that's the place to go. You can engage with us, of course, on social media as well. We're on Twitter at PhysicsPod. Until next time, then, please do take care.